Again, as we come to God's word, Heavenly Father, that is our heart's desire that you would be glorified in our lives. Lord, as we open up your word now, we pray that you would do your work in us, that your spirit, that he would give us eyes to see and convict us, strengthen us, deepen our faith, that we would be more holy, more useful for your purposes and for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, please open your Bible now to the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk, we are finishing up, Lord willing, this wonderful, small, prophetic book this evening. It has been informative. I know it's been an encouragement to me. I hope it has to you as well. After this evening, the next couple weeks, Tyler is going to be teaching for us. Uh, We have our membership service coming up. We have Thanksgiving. Uh, Jeff Maxwell will be preaching the week after Thanksgiving. And Jeremy Lehman will be preaching early in December. And uh, and then we will be um, looking at the gospel from God's word leading up to Christmas. And that's really our plan through the end of the year. And then, Lord willing, shortly after the beginning of the year, we will pick up in 2 Peter, and we will work our way through 2 Peter. But for this evening, we are in the book of Habakkuk, and we're in this last chapter. We'll be finishing up this wonderful book, as I mentioned this evening, and thus far, we've seen Habakkuk address God with his concerns and with his burdens. This book started with Habakkuk concerned for the state of Judah and questioning God's concern for his people. Has God no regard for justice among his people, Habakkuk wonders? Does he not care for the holiness of his people? We've seen this dialogue go back and forth. God responds that he is doing something. In fact, he's raising up the Chaldeans to be a means for chastening his people. They are a means of discipline for the people of God. Well, this response of God's only concerned Habakkuk more And he was wondering, God, how are you going to use someone so wicked and so destructive as these people? The solution in Habakkuk's eyes is worse than the problem. And God responds again, pointing to his own faithfulness and his own trustworthiness that he is just, he is righteous, he is holy, he will judge, he will deal with the wrongdoings done against Israel And we see that God is both actively involved in all of the dealings of the world and he sees and will deal with all sin. Throughout the book, we've been watching this wonderful example unfold, this demonstration of how to bring your concerns to God when you're struggling. How do you bring your concerns to God? How do you direct your heart towards the Lord when life just doesn't make sense. When you're looking at your circumstances and it seems like God is absent or he's somehow deficient in what you thought was true about his character. When it feels like he doesn't see or he doesn't know or he doesn't care about the hardships in your life, where do you go and what do you do and how do you do it? How do you bring these concerns to God and where do you look for answers when life just doesn't make sense? And now after hearing God's answer to his concerns and struggles, what we're gonna see this evening is Habakkuk's final response. And so for this evening, we're going to make three observations as Habakkuk hears God's answer to his question. Three observations as Habakkuk hears God's answer to his question. And as Habakkuk has voiced his concerns and shared his burdens, brought them to the Lord, and he has heard God's answer, what does he do next? What does he do with God's answers? And that's what we get to look at this evening. First, Habakkuk humbly responds We're going through the whole chapter, so we're just, as we did last week, going to work our way through this as we cover each of our points this evening. First, Habakkuk humbly responds. Chapter three begins with a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. Look at verses one and two of chapter three. 
We see in verse one, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth, Lord or Yahweh, I have heard the report about you and I fear. O Lord or O Yahweh, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so chapter three begins with this prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. And here we see that Habakkuk is responding back to God's answer to his questions, offering a prayer to God. At the end of verse one, we see this phrase, according to Shigianoth. It's unknown exactly what the meaning of Shigianoth is, although it is quite fun to say. It seems likely, uh, according to most scholars, that they agree that it's most likely a musical notation indicating that Habakkuk's prayerful response was to be sung as a song by God's people. This was a prayerful response. It was a worshipful response. At the very end of the chapter, we'll look at it in a little bit, it seems to confirm this belief as he says, for the choir director on my stringed instrument. And so as Habakkuk is responding to God's answers and has been struggling with why the righteous suffer and why God oftentimes seems to remain silent when his people are treated unjustly, he's heard God's answer and is taking a worshipful, humble, submissive posture before God. And look at what he says in verse two. Lord, and it's all caps, so we know that is Yahweh, the covenant name of God. I have heard the report about you and I fear. Some versions may say, I have heard of your fame and I stand in awe of your deeds. Habakkuk's response is grounded in humility before the greatness of God. His posture is one of submission and fear and humility. And we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And here, Habakkuk is reverential. He's worshipful. He's humble. And this reveals his disposition all along before God. How he has been conducting himself at the heart level as he has brought his concerns to the Lord. He wasn't ever putting God on trial in his questions and concerns. He wasn't viewing himself as the decider of if God was just or righteous in what he was doing. He brought his concerns. He brought his burdens. But he actually wanted to hear from the Lord. He wanted to align himself under God in the midst of his hardship, in the midst of his trials, in the midst of his affliction. He was sincerely struggling, and yet he was able to humbly bring his struggles to God. Parents, there are times when your children come to you asking questions, and it is clear they don't want to know the answer. (laughs) They're trying to pin you to the wall. Uh, They're coming with questions, but really it's an argument. Uh, They're coming with inquiries, but really it's just a desire to get what they want or actually an attack on your parenting. That's not what's taking place here. Habakkuk has come to the Lord with a posture of reverence and fear, and we see that expressed through his response to God's answers. He brought his questions, he brought his concerns, and the Lord responds. And he doesn't respond with the answer Habakkuk actually wanted. His response only brought more difficulty for him, more confusion. And then he went back to the Lord. Lord, if this is true, then why? You're gonna use the Chaldeans, they're more wicked than we are. They're gonna overtake us, they're gonna destroy your people. And he comes to God again, and then he hears God's answer. This response of Habakkuk reveals he actually wanted to know the answer. How instructive is that for us? How helpful is that for us when we bring our concerns to God? When we bring our struggles? 
that we don't come just wanting him to do what we want him to do, but we actually want him to do what brings him the most glory. And so when we see truth from his word that we wrestle with in our heart, are you ready to say, Lord, I fear. I've seen your awesome deeds. I've seen you work. I've seen you be faithful. I've, I've seen you use dark, dark days to bring about unparalleled good for your glory. Namely, the cross. And so I fear. Revive your deeds. Look at verse 2. He says, Revive your works in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. His humble response comes with a humble request, and it's threefold. He, he wants God to preserve life, the life of his people. He wants God to provide understanding, and he wants God to remember mercy. And at the heart of it, Habakkuk wants God's purposes to be fulfilled. He wants God's work on earth to be accomplished. He desires God's glory to fill the earth and his works to be seen He's going to recount God's mighty deeds in a moment, but here he requests God in our time, in my time, keep active in your works for your people, in your wondrous deeds. And again, this is insightful for us when it feels like God is distant to remember his work in the past and to pray, God, keep working as you always have. Lord, you have always only ever been faithful. Please, Continue to only ever be faithful in this circumstance. Perform your good purposes. How do you think it would please the Lord if every time each of us experience a hardship, our heart's cry was not remove the hardship, change my circumstances, do what I want, but Lord, Continue your work and have your way in my life. That is a worshipful, reverential posture before the Lord. That is a prayer that the Lord will always answer for his people. The crux of the request here is a a petition. It lies in the last phrase where he says, in wrath, remember mercy. Wrath comes from the word indicating trembling or to shake, and mercy comes from a word associated with the womb, indicating compassion and tenderness. And that is what Habakkuk desires for the people of God. Even in God's anger toward the rebellion and sinfulness of Israel, Lord, remember mercy. Be merciful. You're going to use the Chaldeans to bring judgment and discipline upon your people. I know what they're capable of and how they wipe out nations. Lord, don't bring us to the end we deserve. But remember us. Preserve us. Even in the discipline God is bringing to Israel through the mighty Chaldeans, Habakkuk's cry is, please remember mercy. Don't be done with us. Don't don't let them completely destroy, destroy us. He's asking for a miraculous work of God to do wonderful things in his people, to preserve them and sustain them and to show mercy to them. And as Habakkuk humbly responds in verse three, we see him transition and now he worshipfully recounts. That's number Number two, he worshipfully recounts. We see this in verses three through 15. In verses 3 through 15, Habakkuk worshipfully recounts God's greatness, and he does so in the form of a beautiful, poetic theophany. Uh, A theophany is, is something that describes an appearance of God in great power and glory. And so it seems Habakkuk is recounting God's faithfulness to Israel and his amazing demonstration of supreme power and sovereignty over all things. And so he presents this request to the Lord, and now he's going to recount God's faithfulness and greatness in the past. Look at what he says in verse three. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. And these are parallel statements, meaning they communicate the same truth. 
Teman was a district of Edom located to the southeast of Judah, and it was an extremely fertile area. It was a key crossroad for important trade routes, and Paran was a mountainous area southwest of Judah in the Sinai Peninsula. And these two areas used in parallel are referencing God's giving of the law and leading of Israel in the wilderness, and this reference would have been a vivid reminder of the work of God in bringing the nation of Israel out of Egypt and into being. The mighty work of God. He is the God who led the patriarchs and he is the Holy One who possesses moral perfection and purity. And then he says, Selah, and this communicates God's presence and work in all of this, this worshipful, worshipful reverence and It's most likely a cue of some sort of musical arrangement that was to follow. We see it several times throughout the poem or throughout the hymn. And then he says, his splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. These two phrases really introduce the onslaught of magnificent expressions of God's greatness that are about to follow in these verses. He says his splendor or his majesty, or you could say his glory covers the heavens There's no place his greatness does not reach and the earth is full of his praise. And the emphasis here in the earth being full of his praise isn't on so much the one praising him, but rather the earth is full of what incites praises to God. This is pointing to God's praiseworthy nature. And then in verse four, he continues to reflect on God God's greatness and majesty. In verse four, he really talks about the glory of God saying his radiance, look at verse four, is like the sunlight. He is rays flashing from his hand and there is the hiding of his power. This is reflecting on his glory. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand. Again, a poetic expression of God's supreme power and glory. And then the last phrase, and there is the hiding of his power, is a poetic expression that even in his sunlight, like radiance and supreme power, we are not seeing the entirety of God's greatness, and yet there is a a readiness of God to apply himself and take action with his hand for his people. We see his radiance and his majesty in the earth, And we know that his hand is powerful, and yet not all is even revealed of his power. Some of his power is yet hidden, meaning he is supremely great and powerful. It's meant to extol God, to recognize his greatness. God is ready to take action for his people. In the next verse, we actually see this expressed as God controls the forces of nature. We saw this in vivid fashion in as God delivered Israel out of Egypt through the series of plagues. Look at verse five. Before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. God is a triumphant God, defeating his enemies and can withstand any onslaught of his enemies enemies with definitive power. And then in verse six, the mountains and hills were symbols of grandeur and prominence and security in the earth and yet before God, they were frail. God is the all-powerful, eternal God. Look at verse six. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. That is God's power. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. God's power is on display. The most secure, stable things of this earth are nothing before him. And then look at verse seven. I saw the tents of Cushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Again, these two lines communicate parallel thought, equating the tents of Cushan with the tent curtains of the land of Midian. Israelites at this time would have understood this to indicate the Lord's dealing with opposition from the Southlands and would continue to show again his power and majesty in all the earth. Surrounding nations that would roam and take over anyone in their path, tremble before God. That is his power. In verses 8 through 15, we see really what then accounts to a victory song of the greatness of God. Look at verse 8. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? 
Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? What Habakkuk is doing is through a series of rhetorical questions, we see the point that God did not simply come to subdue the natural world merely to exercise his power over creation alone. He did that, but he had divine purpose in exercising his power. He had divine purpose, and the divine purpose for exercising his creative power was the purpose of saving his people. And this will be made clear when we get to verse 13, but watch how Habakkuk continues to develop this line of thought of the greatness of God over all things, and yet this greatness is all moving toward a specific purpose. Verse nine, he says, your bow was made bare. That is, his bow was revealed. Uh, This weapon of power for warfare was put on display. That's Habakkuk's point. The rods of chastisement were sworn. Okay, this can be, this is getting interesting. (laughs) What does that mean? Well, Hebrew can be tough. The word for rod can have a number of different translations. It can also be used for staff or sticks rods or arrows or even tribes. And then the word for sworn can mean word or speech or decree. Uh, I actually think the NIV does a really good job with this section. Tom, put that in your back pocket to pull out on a rainy day. It says, these sworn are the arrows with a word. This sworn are the arrows with the word. Is that right? Or did it autocorrect to something different? That's right, right? Yeah, this sworn are the arrows with a word. The idea most likely is that these arrows flung by the bow that is revealed are divinely commissioned by God to do his work. I think that's the best way to translate it. So God's, his bow is made visible. His weapon against his opposers is able to be seen And the arrows that he directs are true to his aim. They go exactly where he aims. That's what I think he's saying here. His exercising of his divine power against his enemies always hits its intended target perfectly in accordance with his will. The idea communicates supreme power with supreme precision and complete success. Is that not amazing? That is God. And then we see that marker again, Selah. And he says, you cleaved the earth with rivers. God's power divides the land with waters. Even the rushing rivers do God's bidding. And then verses 10 through 12, the mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation, you marched through the earth. In anger, you trampled the nations. And we continue to see this poetic description of the awesome power of God over creation. The sun and the moon stood in their places. This is a reference to the long day of Joshua in Joshua 10 when God preserved the length of day to give Israel victory in battle. Like a farmer working his crop, God marches through the earth and tramples the nations like one threshing grain and throwing away the chaff. And yet all of this demonstration of supreme and awesome power, all of this was for a specific intended reason. Look at verse 13. You went forth for the salvation of your people. For the salvation of your anointed, you struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. Selah. God did all of this to accomplish his purposes and to remain true to his promises for his people. For the salvation of those set apart, designated for him. And this graphic, vivid imagery of God's decisive victory over the supreme human authority is communicated. You struck the head of the house of the evil. 
to lay him open from thigh to neck. For the opponents of God, God takes that one, lays him open from thigh to neck, which is used to describe complete and total victory, completely defeating his opponents. The head of the house of the evil just represents the the ruler of those who oppose God. Verse 14, you pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exultation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. God pierced with his own spears, or again, it could be arrows. I think that's most likely what it is. The heads of his throngs or the heads of his warriors. So the the pinnacle of the warriors of those who oppose God, God dealt with them swiftly and directly. They came in to scatter us. They came for victory like a wild animal secretly stalking its prey. The statement, their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret, I think is actually communicating those who are rejoicing over their secret attacks to come in and overtake others. God dealt with all of it. He trampled on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. God is a warrior for his people who cannot be deceived. There are no sneak attacks on God or his people. Just think about that. Whatever is going on in your life that is hard or difficult, whatever opposition you face, none of it catches God off guard. No one creeps through the back window and brings opposition against you and, oh no, God's caught off guard. I hope he can get it together and deal with it. Nothing surprises him. Nothing takes place outside of his knowledge He is intimately aware of all of the dealings of his people. He has creative power over all things. He exercises that power for the salvation of his people. And those who oppose him, he addresses with decisive, direct opposition and victory. God's majesty fills all of creation Think about what Habakkuk has put forward here. His majesty fills all of creation. His power is supreme. He's the fiercest warrior with the most effective weapons. There is never collateral damage in his dealings with his enemies. He cannot be deceived or snuck up upon. He commands every element to do his bidding, and he uses all of these resources for the good and the salvation of his people. That's what Habakkuk is acknowledging That's what is encompassing his prayer. That is his heart being reflected in song. That is the God that we serve. That is the God who loves us. If you're in Christ, that is the God who loves you. We need to remember this. It is so easy to be tempted to think the olives should fail and the fee olives should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. He fears God and he trembles and he accepts what God says is coming, the discipline of the Lord. Habakkuk is saying, even though we are in a season of discipline, even though our circumstances are confusing and hard and it all looks bad to me, because I know what is true about you, because I've recounted your deeds and your character and know the God you are, even though my circumstances are bad and hard, I will wait patiently and submissively and quietly because he knows God is good and he fears And so then with this reverential, submissive posture, verse 18, he reverently rejoices. All this is going to come to pass, and he accepts it. And in verse 18, he says, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on high places, on my high places. For the choir director on my stringed instrument, Habakkuk has brought his concerns to God. He's struggling with the circumstances. 
God has told him, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And then he struggles with that. And God says, I am still God and I have purpose and I will deal with sin. I will address your oppressors. And in all of this hardship, Habakkuk's response is not one of, just gotta tough it out, hard season. Just gotta get through this. He isn't merely getting by in the hard time. He is actively rejoicing in the God of his salvation. In verse 19, though it is hard, he rejoices, he looks to God as his strength. And God will give him feet to persevere. Have you ever felt like just the ground is giving way beneath you? I can't even pick myself up. I can't even get out of bed. Things are so hard and I'm so distressed. Sometimes we feel that way and we can't even say what is so hard. We just feel as though the earth is giving way beneath us. Or I just, I just can't take another step, this path. It's too hard. It's too weighty. Habakkuk has confidence in the Lord as his strength. There have been many times I know many of you have heard me say it where Julie and I thought we were hanging on by a thread and we would say, but it's God's thread and it will not break. We can have confidence in the strength that the Lord gives to his people. Our obligation is not to conjure up the strength in ourselves. It's to faithfully walk the path he sets before us knowing that he will give us the strength we need. If you saw some of the places that deer go, you would not believe it. How could they get there? He says, you've made my feet like hind's feet. I remember the first time that we as a family harvested a deer. This might be untasteful for some of you, but we were playing with its leg, (laughs) looking at the hoof and how it bends and how it contorts. It was astonishing how God has created the deer's hoof and feet, how he has created them and the places they can go. Our dogs loved the feet even more than we did. God has given us what we need to go places we can't imagine. And he will be with us in those places. He will make us walk on these paths we would have never chosen for ourselves, but he will hold us fast in them and he will do wondrous things through it. That is God. That is the God we serve. And you know what I love about this book? Habakkuk is distressed by his circumstances. He seeks God for answers. And here at the end of the book, he is worshipfully yielded to God, praising him, trusting him. He has confidence in God. And none of his circumstances that led to his distress have actually changed. He's only been told it's going to get harder. That is so instructive for us. Don't run to God pleading with him to bend himself to your will. Run to God pleading with him to bend your will to his. He will satisfy you. He will sustain you. He is the God of your salvation. He will make your feet like hinds feet. He will take you places you never imagined you could go. And he will sustain you in those things. He will be faithful to his character. And he will bring all these things to pass for your ultimate spiritual good and his glory through your life. And what a privilege it is to get to live for his glory. God may or may not change the hard circumstances in your life. He will always give strength to his people to endure those hard things. He just won't fail. And he always has purposes in his ways for his people. He is righteous and he is holy. And as he told Habakkuk, I am doing something. He is doing something even now in your life for your good and for his glory. He is supremely faithful 
and he uses supreme faculties that he possesses and resources to accomplish his perfect will for his glory. He does it with perfect precision and he does it with divine loving care. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Habakkuk. Lord, we especially thank you for what it reveals about you. Thank you for this example of one who is burdened and distressed and brings those concerns to you with a humble, worshipful posture. Thank you for your good response that you hear the cries of your people and you answer and you care and you tend to us in our weaknesses and you strengthen us to endure things we could never endure on our own and to go places we would never go on our own. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to worship you and praise you in the midst of our hardships, in the midst of our anguish, in the midst of our confusion. Help us to yield to you with a worshipful heart that trusts and believes, knowing that you are faithful and you are good. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.